Now, I talked about a global recession, and people go, well, isn't, isn't that like your liquidity crisis? No, a recession or a depression is very different than a liquidity crisis or a financial panic. They're two different things. They can, can and do happen separately. On October 19th, 1987, we had a financial panic. The, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 22% in one day, but there was no recession. In 1998, a Russian long-term capital management crisis, and I, I had a front row seat on that one. I negotiated the uh, the rescue of, of long-term capital management. We were within hours of shutting down every market in the world, just hours away. The deal got done, that didn't happen, but it was very close, dangerously close to happening, more than people will realize. We had uh, you know, finance ministries and US Treasury and the Federal Reserve and every lawyer in New York working on that one, uh, but I was, you know, kind of, leading that and uh, saw how just how bad that could get but there was no recession there was no recession in the united states the nasdaq was on its way to uh you know record highs um the economy was expanding in 2000 we had a recession but did not have a financial panic nasdaq dropped 80 percent, but there wasn't a lot of leverage involved in that and it didn't spread to uh banks and brokers and 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 other institutions in 2008 we had both in 2008 the financial the economic recession or depression and a financial panic converged. So they can happen together, but they don't have to. They can happen individually. What we're, what we're in for looks like a global financial crisis and a global recession at the same time. Now, why do I say that? Um, there's a global dollar shortage. Now you have to look behind the curtain, not to get too in the weeds, but you got to go behind the curtain of the international monetary system and understand what's there. The international monetary system is not driven by a central bank. Sorry. Reserve Bank, sorry, Fed, you're not in charge. The parties who are in charge are the Euro dollar banks. When the Fed prints money, yeah, they print it $9 trillion, but they do it by buying bonds from the banks and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed. That money doesn't go anywhere, it just sits on the Fed balance sheet. The money that can drive an economy is comes from lending and, um, and, and basically checking accounts where a bank will make you a loan, put the money in your checking account and you go spend it. That, that can get some economic growth going. But the Euro dollar market are the major banks transacting primarily in dollars, but it can be foreign currencies from time to time, outside of any regulatory scheme, outside of anything the Fed sees, outside of what the Bank of England sees, et cetera. It's there, it's big, but it's amazing how little central banks understand about the Euro dollar system. Now, here's the point. There's a global dollar shortage. And people go, wait a second. The Fed printed $9 trillion, uh, which they did in 2020. It's come down since then, but they did print that much money. How could there be a global dollar shortage? Well, what people don't understand is that behind the curtain, off balance sheet, there are one quadrillion dollars of derivatives, and they have to be supported with collateral. And the collateral is not 100%, not even 10%. I mean, kind of 1% or 2% is enough. But when you're in a liquidity crisis, banks are extremely choosy about which collateral they'll accept to support this quadrillion dollar inverted pyramid of derivatives. But this is in the data again, not anything that we've invented. What we see the banks are saying, I, I don't want you, I don't want corporate bonds as collateral. I don't want your mortgages as collateral. I don't even want 10 year treasury notes as collateral. The only collateral I want are, are short term US Treasury bills. Treasury bills have a maximum maturity of one year, 360 days, but there can be four week bills, eight week bills, six month bills, et cetera. That's the, only, that's the best form of collateral. It's the most liquid, easily traded, low volatility, easy to repledge is by far the best form of collateral. That's all the banks want right now. But if you're a foreign bank, if you're, you know, Barclays, well, actually even the US Bank City or whatever, but if you're Barclays or Deutsche Bank or others and you want, you need dollars, to buy the dollar-based collateral. If you want treasury bills that are denominated in dollars, you need dollars to buy the bills. That's why the US dollar is so strong. People go, wait a second. You know, the US has a, you know, a multi-trillion dollar annual budget deficit, uh, a massive trade deficit, uh, 132% debt to GDP ratio, $31 trillion in debt. Uh, you're going into recession. How can the dollar be so strong? The answer is everything I just said has nothing to do with the demand for dollars in international foreign exchange markets. What's driving the demand for dollars 
is the need to get dollars to buy dollar denominated collateral, specifically treasury bills, to post as collateral to support the one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And that's going to persist for until the system crashes, which it's in the process of doing. So that explains the dollar shortage, by the way. It's why you see China's reserves are going down. Japan's reserves are going down. India's reserves are going down. Switzerland recently did a, a dollar swap uh, with the Federal Reserve. Why would Switzerland need a dollar swap? Not enough dollars. So this is going on all over the world. People go, oh, they're dumping U.S. Treasuries. They don't like them. No, they're, they're desperate for U.S. Treasuries, but they have to use their dollars to prop up their local currencies because of this dollar shortage I described because they can't get them from their banks or the Fed or any other source. And by the way, uh, this shows up in the um, U.S. Treasury curve is inverted between one year and 10 years. Why should that be the case? I mean, normal treasury curves are upward sloping. Uh, if I lend you money for a year, I might win a certain interest rate. If I lend you for money for 10 years, I want a higher interest rate. I got more risk, you know, inflation, default, credit. But in fact, one-year rates are higher than 10-year rates. It's even worse in the euro dollar futures. Euro dollar futures are a little esoteric, but it's publicly available information on the CME website. And what you'll see is that uh, in the very near term, meaning, pardon me, meaning December and the first quarter of 2023, uh, rates are upwardly sloping, as you would expect. That's the part of the yield curve that Fed controls. But go out to the end of 2023, December 2023, you'll see the rate, the yield of maturity is lower. Why should it be lower? Because this is the big money. These are institutions, sovereign wealth funds, major banks, major hedge funds, the big boys and girls. This is the most professional money. They see what I see. They see what I'm describing. That is, this, the recession is going to be very severe. The global financial crisis is coming. Um, I'll just kind of wrap up quickly with uh, Japan, Europe, and Canada. They're all technically in recession right now. Not, not extreme, but it's the thin end of the wedge. Um, as winter comes, the impact of higher energy prices kicks in. Energy prices have already soared in, in Europe. Oil is a world market. You can't get, uh, there are 72 kinds of oil based on viscosity and sulfur content, et cetera. That's not true of natural gas. Natural gas is much more of a regional market. It depends on infrastructure, pipelines, hubs, distribution channels, sources, et cetera. Very hard to move. The UK special forces operating really at the behest of the United States blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, it really looks like war on Germany. Uh, it's an act of war by UK uh, against Germany. We've seen that you know, twice in the 20th century. We know how that uh, turns out. That was done to remove Germany's options to make a separate peace or accommodation with Russia. So Germany's desperate. Uh, you know, you'll hear, oh, hey, Germany has uh, uh, their gas reserves are up to 100%. Their natural gas reserves are at 100%. But what they don't tell you is that the natural gas reserves are only 20% of what they need. They have 100% of 20%. How are you going to get through the winter? Um, there's every reason to expect this will be a bitterly cold winter. You're looking at extreme energy shortages. Thermostats in Germany are going to be set at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they're going to have to ration fuel between industry and home use. Uh, there's not enough to go around. There won't be. Europe had announced a uh, major natural gas deal with Gutter. Gutter was going to supply the EU with natural gas. And again, you got to read, read the whole story, read the fine print. It said, yeah, and it will be ready by 2026. Yeah, good luck getting through the next four years. So Europe's already in a recession. It's going to get worse. Japan, same thing for other reasons. Japan's major trading power. If the world slows down, Japan slows down. Uh, and also you see that uh, a trade is up in Japan, but a lot of that is nominal dollars, you know, converting yen to dollars and standing at nominal dollars. What they don't tell you is that volumes are down. Because the only reason trades up in dollars is because you're paying more for everything, but it doesn't mean you're importing more. If you look at quantities instead of prices, um, trade is actually uh, contracting in Japan, which is what you would expect based on contraction in China and the United States. So that's the uh, rundown, not a pretty picture, but look for a global recession.